So thank you very much for joining today. And um, we'll be discussing today on the 10th chapter. Last time we started it. And uh, we'll continue that discussion where our topic we'll discuss is, is nature sacred? And does the Gita teach eco-friendly living? So this is based on 1017 in the Gita. So Katham Vidyam Aham Yogims Tvam Sada Parichintayan Keshu Keshu Chabhaveshu Chintyo Sibhagavan Maya So Katham Vidyam How can I know? Vidyam is to know. Katham is how? Aham Yogim He is telling that you who are the supreme yogi, you who are the topmost in the category of people called yogis, how can I always meditate on you? Keshu Keshu Chabhaveshu. In what all manifestations? Chintyo Sibhagavan Maya. How can I, in what all manifestations can I contemplate on you? So this verse raises a very important question about a important directive of the Gita. One of the most consistent themes of the Gita is that we need to constantly remember Krishna. And just before this, there has been the Chatur Shloki Gita, one of the verses from which we discussed earlier. Krishna says that how the topmost devotees, Machittaha, they always remember me. So now, how does one go about remembering? At one level, the remembrance is, so Arjuna is asking is, how do I remember? Keshu, Keshu, Chabhaveshu. Now his question is, not just how do I remember, but it's a little more specific. Uh, that, how do I remember you in this world? So let's try to understand this. That, there's one way to remember God is, say we go to a temple, we look at the pictures of Krishna, we hear the stories of Krishna. And that way, we are bringing ourselves in contact with Krishna. And then naturally, there will be remembrance of Krishna through that. However, we cannot do these things constantly. Even in the past, unless somebody is a renowned sage, people, Arjuna had royal responsibilities. And we also have our responsibilities. So we interact with the world. And how do we remember the Lord at that time? So Krishna is being asked this, how do I remember you in this world? And Krishna answers by giving Arjuna some guidelines about how he can be seen in the world. So that is what we will discuss in today's session. We'll discuss uh, three aspects. So understanding Vibhuti, which is the, the theme of this chapter 10 chapter called as Vibhuti Yoga. Then we'll discuss Understanding the universe as a form of the Lord. And then we'll move forward to appreciating eco-friendly living. So now, Vibhuti, to understand that, first, first let's look at the word Vibhuti. So Bhuta means existence or manifestation. Uh, the, vibhuti means, V is usually a prefix, that means special. So Vibhuti means a special manifestation. And what is the nature of the special manifestation? The one above the many manifests as the one among the many. There are many things in this world and there is one being above all beings. That is God. So the one who is above the many, the first one is uh, uppercase. That means that this is the supreme being, the one above the many manifests how? as the one among the many. Here the one refers to the one that is the best. So in every area, when we observe things, we are attracted to those things which are of high quality, those things which are excellent. Say, any field, say if we want to start, if we want to start exploring some sports, say watching some sports, then we want to know who are the, who are the best sports players. If you want to maybe learn some, some musical hall, some, learn some musical instrument 
or just uh, start enjoying that instrument, playing of instrument. Then we want to know who are the best performers in that instrument. If we go to a, a new city for tourism, then we want to know what are the most attractive, what are the best buildings over here? What are the most attractive nature, natural spots over here? So there are many things in this world, uh, but our attention is naturally attracted to those things that are the best. So in a sense, now the best can not be simply in terms of beauty, it can be in terms of skill, it can be in terms of power, it can be even in terms of functionality. If you want to buy a phone, we may we want to, okay, which is the phone, depending on our need, which is the phone that gives me the best value for my money. So we see in every area, we don't see things objectively. You know, we consciously or subconsciously grade things and the things that we deem the most important, those things get our maximum attention. That is just the way human cognition works. Because otherwise there, is just, there are just so many things to perceive. Even when we enter into a, say we enter into a room to meet someone. Say if we enter into office for an interview with say the boss of a company. Then the first thing we will look at is the boss. Now, okay, what is the expression? Even when we look at the person, we look at the expression on their face because that may determine the more we interact with them. Now, secondarily, we may notice things, okay, how opulent this office is and other things. Um, so, but the point is that our primary focus is what is most important, what is most valuable, what is most critical from for me from a functional perspective so sometimes the functional perspective is aesthetic so if you want to buy a, some showpiece for our home then we want to look with that which looks most attractive but the point is in this world our attention naturally goes toward things that are consciously or subconsciously graded by us as the best as the most important as the most relevant as the topmost in some scale. So Krishna is saying that whatever appears to you as the best, that is a manifestation of me. That is Vibhuti. So the best sports player, the best musician, the most attractive nature, natural scene, the most uh, attractive man-made scene, that attractiveness manifests from Krishna. So that is Vibhuti. So now God's manifestations are broadly of two types. There's immanence and there's transcendence. Immanence refers to the manifestation of God within nature. Transcendence is the manifestation of God beyond nature. Now we often use the word transcendence in a generic sense. So for example, when we say the holy name is transcendental. So yes, Technically, so when we are using the word transcendental, we use it to stress the point that actually it is non-material. That the holy name is not like any ordinary sound. It is the divine manifesting as that sacred sound. So yes, that is true. Technically speaking, the holy name is an immanent manifestation. It is a manifestation of of the sacred of, the, of Krishna as sound that is perceivable that is by our ears and that is that is articulable by our tongues. So technically speaking, the holy name is an immanent manifestation. The deity is a tra immanent manifestation. Now when we say these are transcendental, what we are stressing is that yes, they, they are manifesting in matter, but they are not matter. Or they are manifesting through matter, but they are not simply matter. There is much more to this. So the transcendental, if we, if we want to, in this term, in, in terms of this classification, immanence and transcendence, so the spiritual world, which is not perceivable to us, that is transcendental, that exists beyond nature. So when God manifests within the world, He is being immanent, but still he remains transcendental in the sense that 
he is not controlled by material nature his essence is not defined by matter so now apart from such special manifestations immanence is also used generically so the vibhuti is used for those aspects of nature through which we which which manifest divinity so what the bhagavad gita's principle is that krishna is asking arjuna how can i remember you and arjuna answers uh, sorry arjuna is asking krishna and krishna replies that actually he gives a list of eman manifestations so the verse 10 20 onward till 10 and 39 uh, in the bhagavad gita nearly 20 verses krishna gives a list of various things that among trees i am the tallest tree among the bodies of water i am the largest body of water that's the ocean among flowing objects i am the river so um he gives various manifestations like that why because in, and that list is indicative it is not exhaustive indicative means that this list is describing points for us to see so at the time when arjuna was present there was a particular world view and within that world view particular manifestations were considered most important in today's world view that that list could be expanded so whichever area we are in so if krishna wanted to say that okay among tennis players i am the number one tennis player whoever it is roger federer or whoever among cricket players i might be i am sachin tendulkar or virat kohli among countries maybe I, uh, whichever country is considered the most powerful at that time whichever country attracts people's attention so that is what i am so the idea is this is whatever attracts our attention we direct our attention toward krishna through that attractive thing so now immanent manifestations are easier for us to remember why because of two reasons first is nature and material things manifested in nature are perceivable by our senses and our consciousness presently exists largely at the sensory level so you now we can think of things inside our head inside our close our eyes and think of them within us and some of us might be able to visualize them more clearly than others but still we don't usually function at the level of thoughts in the sense that not only at that level yeah we, we always have thoughts no doubt but our thoughts are more or less connected with the things that we can perceive tangibly hmm? so tangibly or, or we could say perceive through sensory means even even if we are connecting with people digitally nowadays that's what has happened because of the lockdown but even within the digital we try to have as much sensory perception as possible and say for example if you are only hearing this class to audio there is a certain level of connection that is established if you are uh, there's audio and video then there is a connection that is greater because there is greater sensory perception so so because our consciousness exists at the sensory level and we can see things at the sensory level whereas those which are at a transcendental level we cannot see them so firstly it is visible and it is it is perceivable and we habitually uh, perceive things so both ways immanent manifestations are easier to remember and that's why krishna answers arjuna's question by giving a list of various immanent manifestations and we don't have to necessarily remember the list of all those immanent manifestations but understand the principle so if somebody at the attracted to very various natural objects and they say consider say the niagara falls as the most beautiful um, most beautiful natural scene that they have seen uh, so then which is among natural objects and the niagara falls so that attracts our attention and we understand what is it that makes this thing attractive it is actually manifesting a spark of krishna that attractiveness is coming from krishna krishna will say this later that mama tejo amsha sambhava everything which is attractive manifest mama tejo my splendor 
अंश अपार्ट सो स्पार्क ऑफ माय स्प्लेंडर एट्स ऑफ कृष्णा मैनिफेस्ट सो नाउ व्हेन कृष्णा टॉक्स अबाउट विभूति सो ही यूजेस द ऑलमोस्ट अ सेंस ऑफ वननेस ही सेज फॉर एग्जांपल पांडवा नाम अहम धनंजय इन वन ऑफ द वर्सेस ही टेल्स अर्जुन दैट अमंग द पांडवास आई एम अर्जुन earlier he says among the gods i am indra among shining objects i am the sun now what does this mean it is not talking about ontological oneness ontological oneness means that that it is not that literally arjuna and krishna are the same in if, if that were so then what would be the result of that krishna is speaking the message of the bhagavad gita to arjuna If Arjuna he is actually a Krishna says I am you or you are me whatever we want to put whichever way it is understood but in Arjuna could say at that time okay interesting and if both of us are one then what is the point of uh, you telling the Bhagavad Gita to me I already know it we two are one no Arjuna doesn't tell Krishna to stop speaking in fact our Acharya has described that. when krishna mentions the word pandavas arjuna thinks that krishna will surely say yudhishthir because yudhishthir is the senior most among the pandavas and uh, he is he is known to be dharmaraj the very virtuous person and that is true uh, but he krishna uses the word sanjay why because yudhishthir has virtue bhima has strength now krishna it is said has both virtue and strength So it's not Krishna. Arjuna has virtue, strength, as well as devotion. So that the way the benedictions were sought when Arjuna was born, the strong, the maximum benedictions Pandu sought for this third son of his. So among the Pandavas, for most people, when they think of the Pandavas, the most well-known, the most celebrated among the Pandavas in many ways was, for his accomplishments at least, was Arjuna. so when you think of arjuna you think of how special arjuna is understand and the special power of arjuna what makes arjuna special that comes from krishna so it's recollectional unity recollection means remembrance so in terms of remembrance for those who know as soon as they think of arjuna's special prowess they think of krishna how specially krishna has blessed arjuna and that's how arjuna has these powers so vibhuti is not pantheism pantheism the idea is the idea that everything is god uh, vibhuti does not justify pantheism it actually talks about meditate it talks about tools for remembrance because that is the question of arjuna and arjuna accordingly krishna is answering and as they said the overall principle is that the best in everything represents krishna so we can see whichever field we are in whichever field we are attracted to and especially which whatever things we are attracted to in those fields we can see those as pointing us to krishna as reminding us of krishna now this is a theme which we will explore more in our next session also and but today we will be talking about it primarily in terms of the uh, infusing our vision of nature with a sense of sanctity seeing nature as sacred and for that we'll talk about understanding the universe as a form of the lord so krishna gives a list of many attractive things that manifest him and then he gives the principle in 1041 which i mentioned earlier yad yad vibhuti matsattvam shri madurjitam eva va tatta deva magachchatvam mama tejo amsha sambhava mama tejo amsha sambhava that these are all manifesting a spark of my splendor and once that is described krishna says but this is not all actually not only special things within the universe manifest to me but the universe itself rests on a spark of me athava bahunai tena kim gyatena tava arjuna vishthabhyaham idam kutsnam ekamshena sthito jagat so ekamshena by one spark of me the whole universe by one part of me the whole universe is being sustained so this verse is the seed for seeing 
the universe itself as a manifestation of god and that will be described in the 11th chapter of the gita so we see god not only as someone who exists beyond the universe or some someone who manifests within the universe but he also manifests as the universe so with this vision we actually start our vision of nature starts being seen as sacred so how exactly sacred because it is the body of god it is a form of god so now with this devotional vision what will happen we will see something like say gardening or plowing where we are interacting with nature it is like worshiping the universal form by touching or massaging it so we are not just simply interacting with na nature nature has miraculous potencies and when those potencies are manifested we can appreciate them you know when we when we when somebody is say gardening you know, or as i said plowing at that time we may not do plowing so much but we may be more familiar with gardening uh, but the idea is that how prabhupad would give the example that often we take a seed of a rose flower and that, that has no the seed itself may not have any fragrance the soil itself may not have any very strikingly distinctive fragrance water doesn't have any striking fragrance but we take that seed put it under the earth and pour some water on it and then we get a rose flower so the creativity of nature can be breathtaking and where is this manifesting these are all transformations which are happening within the form of god so it's like when we are interacting with nature so if right now say i'm touching my laptop i'm touching my knee touching my chair uh, wherever you are sitting you are touching various material objects it's we don't we may not we just seeing this see them from a functional perspective so actually we are always surrounded by we are always in contact with various material things and those material things also manifest god so the soul in that sense is always in touch with the divine so we are uh, we start seeing nature as sacred because we see nature as a manifestation of the divine the universal form is a manifestation of krishna however there is more to it that there is another vision of why is nature sacred because we can see the reality as a cosmic family that god is the cosmic father nature is the cosmic mother and all living beings are the children so the idea here is why are all living beings chil considered children because here in the key thing is that there is a cohesive family so the bhag the bhagavad gita in the 14th chapter gives this vision that सर्वयोनीषु कौंतेय मूर्तया संभवंती यह तासाम ब्रह्म महद योनिर अहम बीज प्रदह पिता सो कृष्णा से इज जस्ट एज इन नॉर्मल फैमिली द द अ चाइल्ड इज बोर्न थ्रू द यूनियन ऑफ द मेल एंड द फीमेल द सिमिलरली कृष्णा से इज दैट नेचर इज लाइक द वूम्ब and he is the seed giving father aham bij pradah pita and then significantly he says sarvayoni shukonte ya sarvayoni shu means all species so it is not just uh, people of our particular group our nationality our race our um, religious orientation our religious uh, our religion or uh, even our intellectual psychological orientations it's not even all human beings all living beings are a part of one family and living beings include not just animals but even plants so the idea over here is that nature is sacred because nature is the consort of the divine so now the vision of the sacred can be seen in many different ways one is that the universe itself manifests as a form of god another is that actually nature is in is is the is the means through which we all get our forms just as the mother is the means through which we all get forms the mother gives us our forms so similarly nature gives us all our forms and in that sense we are all her children 
so this is also another way of respecting nature of seeing nature as sacred and seeing nature as sacred is important for us to venerate it properly so now with this understanding um, as i said the universal form will be discussed more in detail in the next session but i am talking about the universal form as one way of looking at the sanctity of nature and we discuss another way also but let's move on now to the point of eco friendly living so now here we will not go into so much into the specifics of how to live hmm, in eco friendly way there are standard practices there are three r's that are often talked about reduce reuse recycle so that is all fine it's important but we will talk about a fourth r over here so reduce means don't consume so many things then the reuse means don't use so many things which are used and throw try to use reusable things and then and then if sometimes we have to throw away we try to recycle those things so reduce reuse recycle by this we all can decrease our carbon footprint on the earth which is fine but there is something more and there's a fourth r that these three r's are usually known to anybody who is uh, even preliminarily aware of always aware of eco friendly living but there's a fourth r that is required and that is a raise we need to raise our consciousness we need to reconceptualize our place and purpose in the universe now why do we need to raise our consciousness in this way that's what we will discuss we we'll look at what conceptions did we have so when will eco friendly living be possible so our we could say over here what were our conceptions of nature so for this what conceptions do we need and what conceptions do we have so consider for example if we look at the pre modern times and then we look at modern times so it's like a pendulum in the past most of humanity was dominated by nature and then since the time of industrialization since the time of technological advancement we started thinking of dominating nature hmm? that we could use technology to dominate nature and both of these are extremes neither of them are healthy or sustainable so we need to cooperate with nature now what do we mean by dominated by nature see some people have a very uh, romanticized view of nature and this romanticized view of nature is that actually nature is very good and we human beings are bad so there are some ecologists who make this point and there is some validity to it but it has to be seen contextually what is that point some ecologists say that for example eo wilson a prominent uh, biologist says that you know if all species on the earth were uh, if any species on the earth were removed it would create a a hole in the ecosystem some balance would be disrupted but if humans are removed it wouldn't create any problem at all in fact most ecological problems would be solved if humans were removed so what is the point of this this can statement it can strike seems striking and strange that means do we don't count to the we don't count in the ecosystem at all we have various problems like climate change will they be removed if we just remove humanity well well yes but what is the implication of that are we saying that humans should be exterminated or that would be like a very misanthropic statement that is not the point over here so is it that we humans are like predators who are destroying nature well yes that has been to some extent the effect that we have had uh, but what what are we supposed to do if that is the case the case is some the case is that we human beings are meant to interact with nature with a elevated consciousness that we need to raise our consciousness to a higher level that is the key point over here so so some people think that uh, they conceptualize that you know if we just roll back things mm -hmm. if we just uh, turn back the clock you know in many for many people there is a there is a romanticized conception of the past or the past was wonderful and similarly the romanticized conception of nature 
well that oh nature is so good but we humans have made it bad so for example if we live in cities and we experience the pollution and the congestion and all these things you might consider natural living to be living in maybe some ideal idyllic cabin in a forest uh, some they might think of that as very attractive and yes it has its appeal however we need to understand that nothing in this world is good or bad see nature is not it is not that nature is benevolent and human beings are malevolent human beings can be benevolent and malevolent and nature can also be benevolent and malevolent it is when it is not just that we are disrupting nature it is not that we are trying to destroy nature yes that's that's what we humans have done but on another level at every moment nature is trying to destroy us how is nature trying to destroy us that is if we consider at every moment in our body a war is going on there are so many germs which are attacking our body and unless our body aggressively defends uh, not aggressive it's very vigilantly defends itself the body will die the body will deteriorate and die so now we could say the body is also nature yes so one part of nature is attacking another part of nature so there are germs which are attacking our body and our wbcs are white blood cells uh, protector cells are defending it so actually speaking if we are we feel let if we give nature a complete free handle nature will run over us nature will dominate us nature will destroy us that is the just the nature of nature it is jeevo jeevasya jeevanam it is a struggle for existence it is struggle for existence where one life form becomes prey for another life form and there are so at every moment your know, nature can come upon us in various ways there can natural calamities there can be predators there can be weather extremities so all these underlie the feature the struggle for existence so we can talk about a, a remote past that may be described in sacred texts where say nature and humanity were living in harmony nature would just the bhagavatam does describe that vision and we'll come to that a little later but if you look at a recent human history for say 700 or 7000 years you know there it is a history filled with so many ways in which diseases come disasters come and humanity has been for a long time throughout history fighting a losing battle against nature where where say say nowadays if we hear about a storm coming a hurricane comes the hurricane causes so much devast devastation and we 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 can we are sometimes jolted out of our our own human created world and suddenly we realize that we are at the mercy of bigger forces but at the same time because we have some understanding of nature so we can predict with some accuracy when the hurricane is going to come and some protection some evacuation is done and that minimizes the damage so if we lived in a world where people were not able to predict such things now in the past people were also predict able to predict in different ways not necessarily through the meteorological science that we have and not necessarily with the same methodology or accuracy the point is that you know we need to recognize that there is struggle in nature and we can't have this uh, starry eyed view that nature is wonderful see nature has a purpose and i'll come to that purpose a little later but the point is it is not that we human beings are simply disrupting nature or destroying nature is nature is also trying to destroy us so in the past the idea was people thought okay we are at the mercy of nature and we are dominated by nature if nature does something we are helpless so now from as uh, from that vision we talked about one extreme of the pendulum we went to the other wish extreme where we thought that so earlier i said that uh, the idea is nature is extremely powerful and it can it can damage and it can it can destroy us in one moment it sustains us but it can also destroy us so then what should we do that the idea became that we should learn to dominate nature and that's what we tried to do so 
and what happened over here yeah through technology through industrialization through urbanization we tried to create if not dominate nature at least create pockets within nature where there was our domination so <clears throat> what happened by this we so the vision of nature started getting more uh, more function more utilitarian and functional that nature is if we can just understand its mechanisms and we can just get control over them then we will be able to dominate them but we see that that has had a lot of counterproductive consequences the nature even if we are able to control some feature of its for some time nature is far more complicated than when we thought than what we thought it was and because of that we control one aspect of it but there are so many other complications that come up because of that so we try to control for fossil fuels so so for example we try to we try to use fossil fuels for accelerating our the pace of our lives using various mechanical uh, devices but then that leads to pollution of the air now we have climate change and then the major the future wars it's in we have wars oil has often been a cause of war or at least a feared a probable cause of war many many experts say that in the future water might be the cause of war water war because water we may run short of water so now there are of course dystopian predictions about the future and it's not that every problem that is predicted by the by by environmentalists is necessarily going to manifest we'll come to that part a little later but the fact is at this stage to recognize that our attempt to dominate nature has not been very successful we have created pockets of security but we have also created um, created chaos and disaster if it is not being seen immediately it is going to come upon us in the future we have built an economy that is based on exhaustible resources in nature and when those resources get exhausted how we are going to move forward is is a matter of great concern it is said that we have not inherited the present from our few, from the previous generations we have borrowed the present from the future generations so we are in way so many ways that attempt to dominate nature has led to problems so now what would be the right way to look at it we avoid both extremes we are not dominating nature and we 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 can't we are not meant to be dominated by nature we are not meant to dominate nature we are meant to cooperate with nature now what vision of nature will will lead us to cooperate so when we talk about eco friendly living it's eco friendly it is not eco controlling it is not eco controlled it's eco friendly that means we cooperate say we understand that we are one part of nature and we need to create space for us to live 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 peacefully and productively but at the same time we need to also have space for others to live so this vision of either dominate being dominated by nature or dominating nature both are not the healthy visions so then what is uh, so what does spirituality have to so if we want to if you want to cooperate with nature how can we go about doing that and how can spirituality contributed to that at purpose so if we can talk about it over here let's come back so this is this is a, this is the uh, theme which has been talked by many researchers so i just quoted one person over here james gustav speth he says that he is a prominent authority in environmental studies his first advisor to the us president on global warming now he he says that 30 30 years ago i thought the top 3 global environmental problems were biodiversity loss ecosystem collapse and climate change i was convinced that with enough good science we would be able to solve these problems but i was wrong the real problems are bigger than that they are things like selfishness greed and apathy for those kind of problems good science isn't enough for that we need a spiritual and cultural transformation 
and we scientists don't know how to do that this is so vital that we don't know how to do that so at one level if people were they thought that if we, we made just people aware that okay this way of living is going to cause a lot of problems so you should stop living in this way but still that knowledge doesn't need to transformation now at one level we all know it as a psychological truth there are so many things which we do we may have some unhealthy habits which we know are not so good for us but still we do those things so just knowledge doesn't lead to transformation and even scientific knowledge about the consequences of the way we are living it's called consequences on the environment just that knowledge doesn't lead to transformation so what do we do about it as i said there has to be a spiritual and cultural transformation so spiritual here refers to a changing our vision of nature and cultural refers to lifestyle that you know we have, our inner conceptions need to change and those conceptions will lead to actions that are transformed by that and that's why it's what do we need for that purpose there has to be inside out change but there is inner pollution that leads to outer pollution what do we mean by inner pollution it is the way we conceive our place and purpose within the universe it is the way we conceptualize nature and conceptualize ourselves in relationship with nature so when we we think as i said it talks about greed selfishness and apathy when we are self centered in our vision so then that leads to problems so either you no know, whole of nature so he also uses apathy means the greed and selfishness refer to the conception of dominating nature you know, i want what i want and i don't care uh, what is the result for anyone else and i want what i want more and more and more that is greed and selfishness selfishness the other is apathy refers to that oh i can't do anything about things so nature is far bigger than me and there's nothing much i can't do about it and we are dominated by nature no we have to avoid both these conceptions the healthy conception is that we belong to nature that we have a part to play in nature we are not the we are not the whole play but it is not that we don't have any part in the play we have a part to play and we play our part and to play this part how do we perceive nature so how can spirituality help so spirituality can help if we have the proper conceptions and that proper conception can foster eco friendly living so what would be a vision of nature within a spiritual way of looking at things so there is one again another pendulum this is slightly different from so the previous pendulum was about just our relationship with nature here it's our relationship with nature or our vision of nature uh, within a spiritual world view within a theistic world view where we acknowledge the existence of god and acknowledge that we are meant to have a relationship with god so one extreme would be that we start worshiping nature itself as god mm -hmm. the other extreme is that we worship god without caring for nature without bothering about nature at all mm -hmm. the in between is we worship god and then we respect nature as a manifestation of god so let's look at what do we mean worship nature itself as god that and in this world sometimes we may get captivated by bad things but sometimes we may get captivated by good things also so the good if we consider a hierarchy the good is always better than bad but if the good stops us from the best the good becomes a replacement of the best that the good can also in that sense become bad so environmentalism environmental consciousness eco friendly living all this is good but environmentalism can itself become like a religion where taking care of the environment becomes the supreme virtue supreme value supreme virtue for people and they don't see any bigger picture beyond the environment so just as there can be religious extremists there can be environmental extremists environmental extremists means they are people who just absolutize caring for the environment 
now such people of just like some, some religious people uh, tend to moralize and lecture everyone down you know you are so you are so terrible you are so terrible you are so terrible they become judgmental about everyone else they condemn anyone who disagrees with them and similarly environmentalists can also become like that now when they become like that what happens is uh, cultivating virtue is replaced by virtue signaling cultivating virtue means actually i work in the hard to to live virtuously but instead of that what we do is virtue signaling virtue signaling is i'll do things which make me seem to be virtuous but i'm actually not it's it's not costing me anything but there are people who nowadays it's we are live in a world of social media so there are like there are the twitter warriors so these people will say oh you know say capitalism is so bad the economy is we we through industrialization we are doing such terrible things and we need to we need to stop all fuel consumption we need to do this we need to do that and they'll pass big big resolutions and they will go to they will go to uh, conferences about environmentalism but they will fly to such conferences in their own private jets and by such fly using fly flighting in their private jets they actually may cause within just a week more pollution than what average human beings cause throughout their, their own life so actually uh, when something becomes a religion for someone and especially a religion that seems to give that person a religion that give a high moral position in society then external posturing becomes more important than inner transforming so lecturing others about what all they need to sacrifice they need to give up for the sake of worshiping god just like in the past there were priests and the the priests would often live in luxury and they would tell others hmm Uh, that all of you have to give this much charity even if you are poor still you have to give your charity but the priests themselves would not live simply they would live in luxury so many now i'm not here painting all environmental activists in one one brush it's very important there are many environmental activists who are fervently dedicated to taking care of the environment and they may work tirelessly selflessly and everybody who contributes to making a better world needs to be appreciated and uh, as environmentally we are in a huge danger and those who can alert humanity about the danger and uh, can do what it takes to avert the danger they are doing laying a, they are doing a very valuable service here i'm talking more about for people who activism is more a means of gaining social prestige and social superiority rather than actually bringing about any transformation so that happens when when we start absolute we start worshiping nature itself as god and then this is not just we are actually not even so much worshiping god but we are using our devotion to god as a means of trumpeting our superiority over others so when this happens this is unhealthy so environmental extremism not it is also unhealthy now the other extreme is also very strange so what happens is that there are many people who are religious they may be devoted to god but they don't care for the environment and this we unfortunately see even in many of the holy places in india that we <clears throat> that in the holy places people consider the place holy but they don't really take care of that place they, they, it's it's considered a sacred place but it is so dirt, there is so much dirt there is so much uh, 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 so many so much filth so much disorder and people don't work to to do anything about it so now if you consider in vrindavan there is a river yamuna and the yamuna is is such a central uh, central part or a central feature 
in Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. And till recently, the Yamuna was extremely polluted. Now, of course, the pollution was not caused by the people living in Vrindavan. The most of the effluents were coming from elsewhere. Upst uh, upstream, for the, uh, there were many industries which were sending all their effluents in. But uh, not much was being done to address it, to correct it. Uh, so uh, people would just come, they would look at the Yamuna, they would maybe feel a little sad that it is, it is looking so polluted. And then they would uh, just go away. But maybe in the la last decade or so, there is some increased activism. The Ganga is considered a sacred river. At, time the Ganga was, at one time, the Ganga was so polluted that the Ganga caught fire. Normally, we consider water as a means to extinguishing fire. But if the water is on, on the top, there are so many effluents which are, which, are which are inflammable. Then on water, there was a fire that was spreading and there was panic, great panic. What is going to happen now? So we, sim we venerate God. We may nominally consider Ganga sacred, but we're not actually taking care of the Ganga. So that is also unhealthy. So the idea should be that we worship God, but our worship of God is also to be seen in how we deal with things that are related with God. And nature is at one level a manifestation of God. At another level, it is the consort of God, which is also similar, it's very intimately connected with God. And that's why now we don't want to make nature into an alternate God, which, which competes with or replaces the which replaces Krishna. But we understand that the way we deal with nature is also we deal the way we deal with Krishna. It's vital to see the interconnectedness between these two things. And with this understanding, naturally, if we consider that caring for nature is the way I care for Krishna, and then naturally we will deal with nature with greater, greater respect, greater see nature as sacred. And the important thing, is which the, that quote which I mentioned was about cultural and spiritual transformation. So how does that cultural and spiritual transformation matter or how does it come about? It comes about because the worship of God as practiced in Bhakti Yoga, it also gives us non-material enrichment. So there are uh, non-material enrichment means that we we all are looking for happiness. And where do we look for happiness? So it is some people say all industrialization, all urbanization, everything should be reversed back. The clock has to be turned back. Well, it's impossible. It's well nigh impossible for most people to do that. So as I said, we are not meant to live dominated by nature either. We, we, need, to, we need to have a safe space and we need to use our intelligence and our industriousness to do to create the safe space. The problem is when our pleasure in life comes by controlling and dominating nature, by seeing how much I have been able to control nature, that gives us a sense of joy. When our purpose becomes the conquest of nature and our pleasure comes from there, that is where the problem is. The Ishopanisha talks about harmony with nature. Take what is your quota. So every living being within nature creates a space for itself. So uh, a tiger will eat, uh, will eat a deer. But a tiger doesn't go about destroying all life forms. So similarly humans, just by existing, there is going to be some effect on the ecology. However, that, uh, that, does that mean that we just stop existing? No, that's not the point over there. But when our sense of purpose in life, our source of pleasure in life is non-material, when it is higher, when it is spiritual, then we, we will be satisfied with whatever space we can create within nature for, that is needed for our sustenance. We, when the problem is not industrialization itself. The problem is not urbanization itself. Even in the past, in the, in the Vedic times, if you look at the Bhagavatam, Vrindavan was rural. 
was a rural place mathura was a urban place so there were forests there were villages there were cities it is not that cities are bad and villages are good yes today the way the cities are they are much more polluted than and they are not polluted and polluting than in the past but it is not that uh, that urbanization itself is bad we live in a particular world way of particular world right now so industrialization uh, globalization all these are facts of life and devotion doesn't mean that devotion can't wait till we turn all these back we may not even be able to turn all these back but the idea is that even within these things we may industrialize but we don't take nature for granted we don't pollute nature indiscriminately we understand that we we are a part of something bigger than ourselves and we can't damage the whole just for ourselves so this vision can foster harmony and this vision is what so that inner pollution refers to thing that thinking that i my pleasure in life is by my power to control nature and then bend nature to my will and get pleasure thereof no we want to survive in nature we want to survive reasonably and respectably in nature we need to create resources for that but our pleasure comes from something higher so the 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 way to eco friendly living is not is definitely we do as is reduce reuse recycle that's important but raise raise our consciousness is extremely important because that raising of consciousness to a spiritual level leads to changing our conception of pleasure and changing our conception of the purpose of our life and then we can live in eco friendly way without feeling deprived or without depriving ourselves unnecessarily but we live harmoniously so we change the cure, the cure for the inner pollution is that we don't ch we change our conception of ourselves we are neither dominator of nature nor dominated by nature we are cooperator with nature's lord and thereby with nature itself so i'll summarize what i discussed and then we can have a few questions i talked today about the uh, is nature sacred and does the gita uh, support eco friendly living so i talked first is yes nature is sacred in what sense we discuss the concept of vibhuti vibhuti means the one above the many manifests as the one among the many arjuna asked the question how can i remember you while functioning in this world so while functioning we don't we don't we can't perceive everything in the world our cognition is structured consciously or subconsciously by prioritization the things that matter to the mo most to us are what jump out in our vision so krishna is saying that whatever things matter to us the most uh, whatever catch our attention we need to see the speciality that makes them catch our attention as resulting from the divine so everything attractive manifests a spark of krishna splendor this refers to the immanence of god so, immanence is god's manifestation within nature transcendence is his manifestation beyond nature and then i talked about uh, vibhu uh, the idea of vibhuti is not oneness in a literal sense that when krishna says among pandavas am arjuna he is talking about that people who are attracted to arjuna they should see that arjuna's speciality is coming from krishna it is a tool for recollection it is not a assertion of absolute oneness and then the same idea of immanence can be extended further that not only are specific things within the universe a list of which krishna gives which is indicative not existive exhaustive it is not just this list of things are sacred uh, being manifestations of, of the divine but the universe itself is a manifestation of the divine the idea of the universal form can help us to see that uh, when we are interacting with nature say through gardening or plowing we are actually touching massaging caressing the form of the lord so that's one way of seeing nature as sacred the second way of seeing nature as sacred is we see nature as uh, the as a as the cosmic mother in a cosmic family where god is the father and we all living beings are the children 
then uh, once we understand this vision of nature then we we talk about first god manifesting through nature that's why it's sacred then the second is the universal form of god that's what makes it sacred and then we talk about eco friendly living which is a major part of the class that we could have different visions of our relationship with nature throughout history humans were dominated by nature there is a there is a relentless struggle for existence in nature and one living being is food for another living being so <clears throat> if we if we have a we can have a myopic view of nature where we might think of nature simply as benevolent benevolent but it's not that simple there is nature is both good and bad human beings are both good and bad by nature when you say nature is good and bad means what that nature's effect on us if if we just uh, live passively the germ if our body were not functioning properly germs would destroy us if we simply lived under a tree then the extremities of weather would destroy us we need to create arrangements for protecting ourselves and so we of course say in a sense we use nature say we build a home we use nature to protect ourselves from nature so now to what extent do we try to change nature to protect ourselves so that is if we start thinking okay i don't know i don't want to be dominated by nature because it might destroy me but i'll try to dominate nature then but that's another extreme and that uh, leads to as we talk about climate change pollution and water water shortage desertification of land drying up of rivers so so many problems have come up now we have built up a economy based on exhaustible resources which will back which, which can which can be disastrous in the long run even in the near future also so then uh, what do we know so we do, if we are dominating nature we are destroying nature by our disruptive ways what can we do we need to live in an eco friendly way so scientists try to spread awareness of how dangerous eco friendly uh, of the current way of living is but that didn't lead to transformation they said that uh, the real problem is not just uh, the the specific human activities that we are doing but the underlying mentality it is selfishness greed and apathy and the solution yeah, that's right yeah, yeah. Miles is my limit. Oh no, dancing or the prevent or anything, just just call it. Oh no, no. House work. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So the solution is that we need to, uh, we need to have a inner transformation, and that inner transformation cannot come simply by providing more scientific knowledge. It needs to reconceptualize our worldview. so if we consider that there's not just we and nature but we nature and god then how will how will considering god bringing god into the picture change our vision of nature one is that we make god only we make nature itself into god and the other is we care for god without caring for nature the making nature into god can lead to environmental extremism where people use uh, people use nature as a means for virtue signaling rather than cultivating virtue and that can just as some religious people become hypocritical and judgmental some environmentalists can also become hypocritical and judgmental so the other extreme is we care for the environment but we say we care for god but we don't care for god's nature for environment so that is apathetic so in between is we care for we worship god and we care for nature also and that i talked about reduce reuse uh, reduce recycle these are practical ways we can live eco friendly but for implementing these practical ways we need to raise our consciousness raise our consciousness whereby we don't see ourselves as dominators of na- dominated by nature or dominator dominators of nature we don't worship nature or worship god and without caring for nature but we live holistically where we worship god and then we respect nature creating space for ourselves without encroaching on anything higher anything more than necessary so raising consciousness means our sense of purpose and our source of pleasure is not in controlling nature but it is in connecting with our with the 
Lord of nature. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, are there any questions? If we consider, how do we see the impure things in the world as connected with God? And how do we see people, bad people and people doing bad actions as connected with God? Okay. This is a valid question and a very important question at that. So when we see things in this world, uh, exactly as we say that there are people and there are things in the world. Uh, and the things sometimes may be impure and people may do evil actions also. So <clears throat> Krishna says that everything attractive in this world is a manifestation of him. So this is 1041. Now in 108, in the same chapter, 10th chapter, he has said that he has said that he is the source of everything. Aham sarvasya prabhu mattah sarvam pravartati. <coughs> so then if he is the source of everything, why is he taking certain things out from everything and he's saying these things manifest me. So attractive things manifest him. So does that mean unattractive things don't manifest him? Does that mean that people who say if you consider attraction as physical beauty, are, is Krishna saying that people who are beautiful, they manifest him and people who don't, people who are not so good looking, they don't manifest him? That's not the point. Krishna has clearly said that everything and everyone comes from him. Hmm? However, Krishna's purpose in the 10th chapter is answering Arjuna's question. And Arjuna's question is, how can I remember you? So now everything comes from Krishna, but everything may not take us to Krishna. Certain things remind us of Krishna, certain things not remind us of Krishna. Now for that matter, it is not that everything attractive can also take us to Krishna. Like consider physical beauty, for example. We might get so captivated by physical beauty that instead of thinking that, okay, this, this beauty, beauty of a person or beauty in nature, that instead of that reminding us of Krishna, we might just become consumed by that. And that might distract us from Krishna also. So the point here is, what is already in our consciousness, see that as connected with Krishna. That is the point of this chapter. That there are certain things, as I said, our, concept, our cognition is structured in such a way that we naturally prioritize certain things in our field of perception. So the things that are naturally in our consciousness, how to see them as connected with Krishna is the uh, purpose of this chapter as, Arjuna, as a response to Arjuna's question. Now, why are there impure things in this world or why do people do impure activities? So, as I said, there is God and we are all connected with God. So, Krishna is all pure. Now, to the extent we go further and further from Krishna, to that extent, we become more and more vulnerable to impurity. So, <clears throat> we become vulnerable to impurity means that... God is the source of our goodness. God is the sustainer of our goodness. Uh, and God is ultimately the goal that we want to achieve through all our goodness. However, when we go away from God, then we are tiny beings, just like a spark of fire that falls away from fire. It can soon become extinguished. So although the soul is innately godly, virtuous, being a part of God, the soul gets covered by various conditionings and those conditionings make the soul do unhealthy things. So when the soul does unhealthy things, then that disrupts, that, that creates unhealthy reactions in nature. So when we see impure things in nature, they are the result of impure actions by people in the world. Now, just because we are living in this world, sometimes 
is the fact of living in this world requires certain things which are considered impure so at one level living in this world itself is living in a state of disconnectedness from god and that itself brings with it certain level of impurity certain level of distress because of our innate disconnectedness with god but even that disconnectedness can be at to different degrees can be at different levels and say there are so everybody in this world has to grow old get diseased and die even people who say live in a godly way people who live uh, in the mode of goodness relatively virtuously but if people live not virtuously but viciously then they will also grow old get diseased and die but they will increase misery increase misery for others and they will increase misery for themselves so the the basic fact of our disconnectedness from god creates certain amount of impurity and greater disconnectedness will create create greater impurity and greater misery so when we uh, see people doing uh, undesirable things doing acting uh, viciously we see them as still they are parts of god but the conditioning that they have covered them that are making them do all these wrong things so hate the sin not the sinner as is in the bible we see that our purity at every souls purity is permanent every souls impurity is temporary so yes if somebody is doing bad things then they need to be they need to be regulated they need to be penalized also at times so but we need to see that they still have intrinsic dignity they are still they are still innately divine being parts of the divine so functionally we interact with them based on the way they are acting but essentially we remember that they are still parts of the divine does it answer your question any other questions so okay when there's a question by um, v pran prabhu that uh, how do we disseminate this message to the world so are you referring to the message of the gita in general or are you message referring to the message specifically of the eco friendly living what what is the specific question here so the whole of the krishna consciousness movement is working to share the message of the gita with the world and we are doing what we can according to our capacity and um, what exactly is the question here uh, okay okay yeah, both we can uh, see it. yeah so so how can we disseminate this message to the world what can we what are we doing about it well <clears throat> there are two distinct aspects that there is spirituality and there are people who are interested in spirituality directly because they want to become more spiritual and then there is applied spirituality which serves people's specific needs and then for that there is uh, there is the presentation of that aspect of spirituality so krishna himself says in the bhagavad gita manushyanam sahasreshu kashchid itti siddhaye itam api siddhanam kashchin maam viti tatvatah that among millions of people a few are interested in me and among those a uh, few are interested in transcendence and among those who are interested in transcendence also actually few come to us few turn toward krishna and mm, no krishna so the people who are going to be directly interested in spirituality are relatively going to be few still even for them they need to be provided spiritual knowledge they need to be provided spiritual resources and that is what we try to do in our own ways so through the direct presentation of uh, the wisdom of the bhagavad gita you know, those who are interested in spirituality or those who have at least some tendency to be in, become interested in spirituality they are they are their interest is triggered and they are provided a channel for turning toward krishna along with that 
there is also a, a great amount of environmental concern. So if we consider the broad world population, within that there is a small se sector of people who are say, interested in spirituality. A big circle, within that a small circle. Now within that there is a bigger, apart from that there is a bigger circle of people who are interested in environmental, uh, environmental issues. That is also not, uh, everybody is not interested. But there are a significantly larger number of people in interested in those issues. So for those who are interested in spirituality, through various channels, through physical, digital, social, whatever, we need to make the Gita's message available for them so that they can be attracted. But for those who are, con those who are concerned about the environment, how the Gita's wisdom can help us contribute to taking care of the environment, that kind of presentation needs to be given. And not just presentation, but also demonstration. I am right now in the Govardhaniko village. And this is a vibrant example of how spiritual vision of things can lead to eco-friendly living. And this is what we are trying to demonstrate over here. And the devotees, uh, 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 the devotees are not only demonstrating living, but they're teaching this kind of living. They're creating models for this kind of living. And this has been recognized by the international community. Many awards uh, at the international level have been won. And so the people who come here are not interested primarily in spirituality. A few are, but a lot of people are interested in just living close to nature and learning how to live more and more in harmony with nature. And then when they see that, okay, actually these people are doing this because of their particular particular vision of life, their particular spiritual orientation. So what is that orientation? And then they, they become interested in that. So we, we need to also learn, uh, not everybody can live in an eco-friendly community uh, or eco-friendly uh, eco place. Uh, not everybody can become an eco-friendly expert or expert in eco-friendly living. But if we are aware at least of the basics of how the Bhagavad Gita's vision fosters eco-friendly living, then when we are interacting with such people, we try to present that aspect of the message rather than telling people simply that, okay, that there is, that we are not the body with the soul or that Krishna is God or simply, you know, why don't you chant Hare Krishna or something like that. We present something that resonates with them. So we can, as I talked about, you talk about three hours, but introduce a fourth hour. Yes, so, okay, yeah, that makes, that's interesting. Well, how do you do that? Then you talk about spirituality. So individually and collectively, we can customize the presentations of spiritual knowledge in a way that is, that can resonate with those who are interested in eco-friendly living. Does it answer your question? Okay, so, so any last question? Shall we stop here now? So thank you very much for your attention and participation. Hare Krishna. I have one question. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Okay. I had a question if you're still here. Okay, you can tell me. You can tell me, then we'll see how much time it takes, and then I'll answer. Tell me the question. Sure, Prabhuji. Sure, Hare Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna. Question related to one of the past sessions on prayers and the uh, aspect of bhakti within the prayers versus asking for material benefits in the prayers. And my question is uh, specifically related to the um, um, Narshima Kavacha prayers. Okay. And uh, in one of the verses, I think uh, it's number 26 or 29, specifically, um, unless I am, I'm sure I am misunderstanding the deeper translation or the meaning uh, that is meant there, but at least on the surface, it seems to me to be uh, asking for a material benefit for the sake of the 
um, is that the right understanding or is it like asking for material benefits uh, like good body, good health, uh, so that we can serve the Lord? I'm sure it's the latter, but I wanted to clarify from you, Prabhu. I think I have answered this question on my website elaborately. Uh, let me see if I can find the answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll briefly answer here, but I am also posting a link for the answer which is there on my website. Generally, on most questions, if you look at, if you're not answered here, you look on spiritual scientists, you'll find the answers. At one level, we try to seek protection of the body. At another level, we understand that everything in this world can be used to remind us of the Lord. So in the Nalsema Kavacha prayers, there is a method of meditation on the Lord where we naturally think of our body, but we use the thoughts of our body as means to trigger thoughts about the form of the Lord. So just as there is the Vibhuti Yoga, where we think of Krishna by looking at attractive things in this world. Similarly, there is a form of meditation on the Lord where we think about, okay, oh Lord who resides in my heart, please protect my heart. So, well, a, so this is a prayer for those who are in bodily consciousness to, they can't reject bodily consciousness immediately and develop God consciousness. But bodily consciousness can be used to foster God consciousness. So, oh Lord, whose arms protect the world, please protect my arms. So the idea is, uh, we cannot leave the place where we are conscious of right now and immediately go toward a higher level of consciousness. Some people can, some people can't. So those who can't, for them, their present concerns are linked with transcendental concerns. So the primary purpose is to at least begin the process of devotion. So, yes, it is said that at one level, we don't pray to God for anything for our material gain. But at another level, it is said, remember Krishna somehow or the other. That is the basic principle of bhakti. So if our present concerns can remind us of Krishna, uh, then, then why not? That is a way to progress on the devotional path. This is not the highest level of prayers. But they are prayers that can get us to the highest level gradually. Okay. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki chai.